Hear now the word of the Lord from the third chapter of James. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the mouth out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be God. You may be seated. <clears throat> Three important words that came to me in my life. When I was in junior high, I hated school. It was the bane of my existence. That's why it's ironic that I'm working in a school. I despised it. I did everything I could to get out of it. I tried to be sick as often as possible. I avoided homework and all of those kinds of things, and thus my grades greatly suffered. Well, the junior high that I went to had started sort of an experimental program. They, the counselor there would sit down with troubled kids, kids who were doing difficult, uh, doing not so well in their grades and those sorts of things. And I remember going and sitting with this counselor, and it was two other guys and me sitting with the counselor, as she took out our files and spread them out in front of her to kind of discuss with us things we were dealing with. Now, in junior high, you'll find this difficult to believe, uh, I was a bit of a nerd. Uh, I was undersized, certainly. I was very short um, and very small. And uh, the kids who were in there with me were not. <laughs> They were the campus toughs, uh, and they were troubled kids, and there were a lot of kids who had a lot of trouble from those troubled kids. So it felt kind of weird to be in their presence as I sat with the counselor. And the counselor began to open our files and show us things that the teachers had said about us or written about us. And I'll never forget that my junior high teacher, my sixth grade or was it seventh grade math teacher, said, if ever there was a kid who needed special ed, this is the one. <laughs> I don't even think she has a master's degree. Anyway. <laughs> it hurt a lot. Uh, and I went home, and I really did go into a funk for a while. I can remember a few months of just being a depressed kid. And finally, my mom pushed hard enough to find out what, what happened. And so I told her, and she gave me a second word. She said, look, when you get up in the morning, and Maddie will attest to this because she hears it from me all the time, when you wake up in the morning, you get to choose. You, you get to decide what kind of day you're going to have today. If you're going to have a bad day, decide now. But if you're going to have a good day, if you want to have a good day, decide right now, and no matter what happens today, you'll have a good day. And it was shocking how well that worked for me. 
A third word came after Jennifer died. And after a few months of deep, deep grief, I remember talking to Michael one afternoon in his office, and he said to me, look, you could spend the rest of your life laying on the couch and never changing your shirt, uh, don't shave, weep, and people would understand that. People would be okay with that. But how is that in any way honoring her? Words are powerful. Words have great power. In some ways, more power than actions. And that's what James is getting at here. And James is an interesting book, and, and we'll, um, we'll talk a little bit more about this particular text. But just some things to say about James as you come to approach it. It's difficult to say when it's written, probably sometime before 70. James, the letter or book or whatever it is, collection of sermons, wise sayings, whatever, has really had a pretty difficult time of it. It was heavily scrutinized before it was included in the canon. Um, James is thought to be in conflict with Paul, and it's rejected by Marcion and all those kinds of things. And then Marcion 2.0, <coughs> Martin Luther, called it a right strawy epistle, referring back to 1 Corinthians 3.12, in which Paul says uh, that the foundation that isn't made of uh, straw will survive the fire, but the straw, the straw will burn up in the fire. So James for Martin Luther is a foundation of straw. Um, I, I, you kind of understand why Martin Luther doesn't like James, and I think it's probably specifically for this text. So just Google Martin Luther insults, uh, or look up his uh, potty mouth, and you'll find that uh, this is probably why Luther doesn't like James. I didn't realize that until I read this text. And I thought, no, he probably doesn't like it for that. But even in our own churches today, James is largely neglected. Why? I'm not sure. Maybe it's because it's so obvious. It's so very practical. It's the Leviticus of the New Testament, right? It's the do and don't do of the New Testament. Um, it's easy to understand. It's easy to interpret. And therefore, it steps all over our toes when James says things. And so, we neglect James. Um, sometimes it's taken as if James is a, a direct rebuke of Paul and his theology. But nothing James says in the entire um, book, letter, sermon contradicts Paul. James is interested in a faith that works a faith that is transformative. Um, and the gospel for James, and I believe for Paul as well, is a transformative thing that works itself out in our lives. Um, merely saying, I believe, without working out that belief in life is to live a dead faith, according to James, and I think that's fairly obvious. Faith without works is dead. And I think what James would say when you come to this text is words are works. So chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Let not many aspire to be teachers. This is why I picked this text today, because I don't get to preach to my colleagues very often. Uh, and it's why I'm a librarian. Um, but, I mean, note Matthew uh, chapter 12, 36 through 37. On the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. By your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you'll be condemned. So, control of the tongue for James is sort of the pinnacle of moral development. It's the end of a life formed into the image of Christ. And it's given expression uh, and found in the control of the tongue. Which is interesting. Sort of the last thing to be tamed in human act and life for James is the tongue because it's this horribly difficult thing to control and he's got the illustrations about the horse's bit and uh, the rudder of the ship which controls the whole body so the tongue drives the person and then verses 6 through 8 in contrast it's, it's largely impossible 
to control the tongue. And, and James goes into comparing it to a forest fire. I remember in 2011, and I'm sure that Dawn remembers much better than I do, were we all in Bastrop in 2011? No, okay, John, you don't remember more than me. Yes. Um, I was, uh, Kara was living in College Station. I'm living in San Marcos, and so I regularly drove 21 to College Station, at least every weekend. Um, would drive out 21, and you know, you do the little jog, and then you're on 21, and you go through this beautiful uh, pine forest, and I've seen photos, I wasn't there at the time, thanks be to God, um, of this massive conflagration. It was just amazing, unbelievable when you look at the pictures and you realize, wow, that's Bastrop, and you can't even see it because it's obscured with smoke. Um, and in that same year, there were a lot of fires. I don't know if y'all remember that, um, but we had a few in San Marcos break out. I remember I got home from work one day, and I was walking out in the front yard. It's a really loud plane flying over, and I'm thinking, what in the world is that? And it was that water-carrying plane about 350 feet over my house. Everything's rattling and shaking, and I see him go about a, a mile and a half away from us, it looks, and open up and start dumping water. And you start thinking, that's pretty close. What in the world is happening here? Well, that's the way the tongue is. It's, it's out of control. It's a massive forest fire. It's capable of sweeping and reaping great destruction in the whole world around it. So, uh, it conjures for me God's command to subdue and control nature. The tongue represents the utter chaos of a sinful humanity. And then finally, 9 through 12, I think is the payoff of James' text. It's echoed and foreshadowed elsewhere in the document. Here, the double-minded man that uh, James will speak of is also forked-tongued. What comes out of a man defiles him. It reveals on what's on the inside. And so for a, a human to speak uh, in a way not in keeping with the gospel is to reveal, from James's point of view, the brokenness on the inside of the person. One can't bless the unseen God while cursing the image of God walking around them. Well, we've all been there and we know that what James says is true. I think that's why it's such a hard letter to preach. We could get up and just read it and sit down, and maybe I should have today. But at least we did read it today, so that's good. But we've all seen communities, we've all seen families, we've all seen churches, we've seen friendships, um, every kind of human relationship torn apart by the power of the tongue. And that's what James is concerned about. A couple of quick points I think that we can take with us. First, if you're going to be a teacher in the Lord's service, Watch out. I don't think we usually take James seriously enough when we read this. But sometimes we should be silent. Sometimes words aren't the answer. Sometimes we should just shut up. And sometimes we should carefully weigh what we say. And be careful the words that we say um, to God's people. Secondly, we're on the road to perfection. It's not to say that in this life, and without the aid of the Spirit, certainly, that we'll ever master the tongue, but I think we tend to read James, in, here in chapter 3 especially, as sort of uh, with the, well, nobody's perfect hermeneutic. Right? We'll never actually get there. We won't ever master the tongue. It's out of control. It's crazy. And so, we might as well just give up on it. But James is all about reducing that double-mindedness, about moving towards sanctification, about moving towards mastery of the tongue, where the tongue is used to bless both God and His walking, breathing images. Thirdly, human speech is incredibly powerful. Maybe the most powerful thing that we do. The world was created through a true and perfect word. The first human gift in the Bible is to name the animals. Language, words, things like that, ought not just be employed but guarded. 
We think about all of the goofiness that's going on in vocabulary around us today and the changing of pronouns and the casual use of language in such a way that tears it apart, where it doesn't mean anything anymore, where we're all going to be Humpty Dumpty uh, in Alice in Wonderland. Language is something to be guarded, cared for, protected, so that communication remains possible. And we ought to be about doing that. And this is most true for us, those of us who would take on the mantle of teacher or preacher or pastor in the Lord's church. There's a certain weight to the words that we employ. So, brothers and sisters, let us do so wisely this week. May God guard our tongues and give us the strength to master them just for an hour or so. Amen.